Welcome to another installment of The Office Corner with H.D. Campbell. As always, I'm your host, H.D. Campbell. We're here with another episode with two very powerhouse authors, as well as activists and entrepreneurs in their own right. My first guest is an author, Monique Marie. She's an HIV activist, powerful author, and you'll get to know her. The second one is James Jackson. He's also a powerful author, as well as an entrepreneur. Get to know them both right after this. When the Author's Corner returns, we'll talk to author, activist, Monique Marie. Get to know DJ Boss on his new Facebook page, Google Plus page, his YouTube channel, or Instagram page. Get to know the Show Me Records powerhouse as he talks about ripping up the stage and still making time for God and family. It's going to be an exclusive interview with DJ Boss coming soon to the Show Me Records page and on the Author's Corner with H.D. Campbell. Relationship issues? Need help talking to your mate? Or just need some advice? Meet columnist Sharifa Nusa. She offers no holds barred advice with your heart and mind. Check out her columns regularly in the HD Insider page on the HD Campbell website at hdcampbell.weebly.com. And as always, let the writing fuel your spirit. Welcome back to the Office Corner. My first guest is a powerhouse in her own right. She wears a lot of hats like Keisha Green and other powerhouse women I've interviewed. Her name is Monique Marie. She's an HIV activist as well as an author, and here's her story. Oh, man, I have to count myself. <laughs> I am, you know, first I'm a mother and a wife. Um, I'm an author. I am a director of my nonprofit organization, Monique Home for Care Army Services, and I'm also a public speaker. Okay. Well, why don't we, well, why don't we go ahead and start at the beginning? Um, pretty much so. Um, basically, you was born in Oklahoma City, which I have a lot of good friends in Oklahoma City. Pretty much so. You came up, you actually enlisted into the Army. Um, yeah. How far did you go? And I was stationed in Fort Jackson in South Carolina. So I, I didn't go too far. <laughs> but however, I did travel across the world because um, I am a military brat. My father was in the Army, so okay. we've been all over the place even before I was enlisted in the Army. Well, military service to me, no matter how far you go, is always good. So I, that, I never minimize it, no matter how far you go into it. Right. Um... Pretty much so, you um, had, after the Army, you sort of took a kind of low point in your life. Can you kind of describe that low point? Yes. Um, what actually happened um, while I was in the Army, um, for pretty much towards the end of my um, career with the Army, I got married. Um, and less than a year from my marriage, I also found out I was pregnant with my third child. And we were all excited about the pregnancy, about the upcoming of the child, um, not only to find out that I also uh, was HIV positive. Mm. So did you ever find out the source? source um well when i found out hiv positive of course we you know did our research and try to figure out how did i became hiv positive because when you're in the army you are tested for um hiv um every well back then it was there every two years i'm not sure how many years it is now so of course i was previously tested which i was hiv negative because i was stationed in germany um when i came back here to south carolina is when i found out i was positive and pregnant um, so, of course, we were trying to figure out who, what, when, where, why, all that good stuff. Here I was a wife. How could this happen to me? And that was going on in my mind. Um, to make the long story short, my um, husband at that time, he did find out he was HIV positive as well. 
Um, and of course, once again, we were trying to figure out the who, what, when, where, why, how, because he was my husband, I was his wife. Um, we did find out that, uh, or I did find out that my husband did have an affair, um, and um, another individual was also infected with HIV. Mm. So um, that is what we found out. Um, if I'm 100% sure um, that he infected me or, or whatever, you know, we cannot, you know, say, oh, yes, he did this or I did this. However, we do know when you put two and two together, we do know that there was an affair and he did infect another female. And so the marriage is gone or how? Yes. Okay. I always tell people, you know, we didn't get an divorce, divorce because of the affair. Um, we were trying to, you know, just like any other marriage, when you have your problems and going through, you know, different obstacles and different challenges, uh, we were going to, you know, you know, we were going to stick through it and push through it because I was pregnant, trying to deal with the pregnancy, trying to deal with that I was newly diagnosed with HIV. However, he did not want to stand up to the to the plate and really admit what he has done. He didn't want to do any of that. So, of course, um, we did eventually get a divorce, um, probably like five, six months later. We did get a divorce, so um, I ended up having a baby, and um, I started to uh, do what I had to do to support my child as well as my other two kids that I had at the time. Okay. Well, one more question, and I'll change subjects here. Um, how, how's the baby? Is the baby, um, is the baby infected or is the baby fine or how? My son, which I have three boys, mm -hmm. um, uh, right now, um, my son, he is, he will be eight, um, March 27th, so he has a birthday coming. When I first had him, I was, you know, you know, what if, I had those what ifs in my mind, um, what do I do? Here I am, newly infected myself, and the doctors had already, you know, told me it's a possibility that he too um, could get the virus. I wasn't um, fully educated about uh, a pregnant woman who was um, positive carrying a child. I wasn't all the way educated about what happened to the uh, child, but the doctor did let me know that it's a possibility. So, of course, in my mind, throughout the pregnancy and when I had him, you know, what if God, you know, what do I do? Um, so the first two years of his life, I had to, it was like a waiting game. And uh, when he turned two, I'll never forget that phone call when the doctor told me, you know, Monique, the, the, your son does not have the virus. They did one last, it was some, it's a procedure they do with kids who um, have a mother who is infected with HIV. Um, the test came back negative. So he does not have the uh, he doesn't have the virus at all, thank God, and he's eight years old now, so he has no trace of it. Okay. Well, switching gears for a second. Um, you're at this point in your life. Uh, you find out everything's going low. At some point, you learn how to fight. Where's, where's that point? What was that point that you decided, I'm trying, I'm, 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 I'm trying to elevate here. What was it? Right. Where did I have to fight? Wow. Um, what point did it begin? You know, I was getting out my creative words after I had my child because I didn't know how to fight. You know, it, I, I just gave up. I was like, you know, you know I was somebody's wife. I was a, a good woman. And you need to tell me I got a, you know, HIV, you know, with stigma and the way the media portray HIV. I was like, this cannot be me. Why am I in this? Why am I in this? Um, so I didn't know how to fight. I gave up. You know, no one told me how to fight. All I knew was my faith, you know, I had to be strong, but, you know, that was so irrelevant for me at that time. Um, my mind was just all over the place, in and out, like I said, psychiatric ward, four or five times. My last experience in the psychiatric ward, which was um, 2009, uh, November 2009, um, I got tired. I got tired of being in that psychiatric ward over and over again. I got tired of myself, and I, began to, and I ended up looking in the mirror one day. And I said, you know what, Monique, you, you got to stand up. You got you got to fight this. You got to get through this. You can do this. And I realized, and I, and I and I and I started breathing on my skin. And I was like, you know what, that's life. 
I, I, I looked at my boys. I think I thought about my boys at that time. I was like, you know what? I got to push through this. I have to fight for those two boys. So 2009 is when I realized that HIV wasn't going nowhere. I still had to live. I still had to continue to do what I had to do for the sake of my children and nobody else. So that's when I realized that, you know what, enough was enough. I'm going to get out this hospital. I'm going to get myself together. And for one, I'm going to love me for me. And that's when, that's when I began to realize that I needed to fight. I started to love me all over again because first, I had to love myself. You know, because I didn't love myself. When I was diagnosed with HIV in 2005, I hated myself. So 2009 is when I realized that, you know what, I am somebody, I'm going to get through this. I have to get through this. And next thing you know, my strength start coming back. My faith start getting stronger. That's when I started pushing through all the challenges and all the obstacles that I was going through. And, you know, every day wasn't easy. I'm not going to lie. I didn't just wake up and, you know, start a fight in and things started changing. It was a process, but I started, the healing started taking place. No. Oh. At some point, you decided to put on boxing gloves, and you decided, I sure did. yeah, you decided to you decided to use those boxing gloves. Now, right. But now, um, since this is the office quarter, at some point, you decided, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book right. called "Living Inside My Skin of Silence." Tell me what led to that book. Well, like I said, I got, like you said, I got put on those boxing gloves or whatever. I started. I was like, hmm, what can I do? I came public. After I started getting my strength back and started just really accepting who I was as a person, when I came public, right in my father's church, um, December in 2009, I came public in my father's church. Just came public, not realizing what I was about to get myself into. I just wanted to get it off my chest. I told his own church that I was HIV positive. I need their prayers, you know, the whole nine my testimony. I had my first interview the following week because of course when you know when they let the cat out that you know the box everyone starts talking and you know oh well he you know, well, he gets HIV positive blah 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 blah. Someone who wants to uh, to uh, interview me. Um, I was like you know I don't I wasn't ready for everyone to like even though I told my dad's church I didn't think I wasn't ready for like the nation and the world to know I was HIV positive but something within me said okay do that interview. So I ended up um, sharing my story on that first interview a week later. Next thing you know, something in me was like, right, write your story. You know, it's one thing for people to hear me speak my story, but it's another thing for someone to have it in their hands and they could actually read the book and see, hey, this lady went through so much. And if she endured all the things that she went through, so can I. Or they could reflect back to that book and say, hey, she made it through. So I just begin to write. I never knew how I hated writing in school. You know, books, you couldn't even really get me to read a book. So because of what I went through, it just, I just started, next thing you know, I just started grabbing the pen and paper and I just started writing away. And that's what made me decide to write. And living inside my skin of silence, I chose that title because I was silent. You know, I got tired. I was smiling at people's faces um, from 2005 when I was diagnosed to, to 2009, to, I'm sorry, till 2010 is when I started writing. I started, you know, I got tired of smiling at everybody's face, telling everyone, oh, it's going to be okay. People thought I had this perfect life. And I was silent about it. People didn't know I was, you know, HIV positive. Even though I was public, everyone didn't know. They didn't know I was HIV positive. They didn't know I was a single parent. They didn't know I was going through a bad marriage. They didn't know I was in and out of psychiatric ward. They didn't know any of that. So I was like, you know what? That's why I named it in, Living Inside My Skin of Silent because on the outside, I was like, I was fine. I was like, you know, I didn't have the cares of the world going on with me, but I was actually battling something within. So that's why I named it Living Inside My Skin of Silent. Well, one thing you didn't realize when you wrote the book, one thing you didn't realize when you started shopping the book, you didn't realize that you were going to start this whole phenomenon going on to where you started going throughout your community and beyond your community. I want you to now go into telling me about your foundation. When I wrote that book, I didn't know anything was going to happen. But I was like, okay, I'm just going to write the book. Everyone's just going to read it and be done. I didn't realize what I was writing in that book was going to actually help other people. And people started asking me all these different questions about different things I wrote in the book. So I was like, okay, Monique, I started talking to myself. And I was like, well, Take it a little further. There's so much more within you. There's so much more than the book. 
he needed to do, you know, he did so much more he needed to do. And I started speaking all over the place. I was like, there's more of me. There's so much more. And I was the type of person ever since I was a little girl. I always wanted to help people. I was that. I was the one in the family that if that person, you know, needed a shirt on their back, shoes on their feet, I was the one to just do whatever I had to do to go help that person. So what was going on with me, I was like, wait a minute. I know what I can do. I want to open up Monique's Hope for Cure Outreach Services. Once again, I didn't know how to open up a nonprofit organization. I didn't know nothing about a business. And I started doing my research. And I started, uh, you know, doing everything that I had to do to open it up. And I started in Holly Hill, South Carolina, a very small, small town. You close your eyes, you're out of the town. Very small. <laughs> and I opened it up because I wanted to be able to help the community, um, which where we raise uh, HIV and AIDS awareness. Um, we give out food, clothing, counseling. Um, people who come there for, if they just want to come and just hang out when we're open, we'll, um, they can come and play games, watch TV, we'll give them lunch. And it's open for everyone, not just people who are HIV positive, because I wanted to help break that stigma. I didn't want people to be afraid to come to my center because it was just HIV positive people there. I wanted everyone to come together because you never, you didn't know who was HIV positive. Well, you just come in there for the services. So, because the stigma on HIV and AIDS, it, it needs to be broken. And I was that type of person that I want to reach out to everyone because no one is exempt from HIV and AIDS. I was a wife. So that's what made me open up when we go for charity services so these people can have a place to go to. You know, if they're hungry and if they need these services, they won't have to go around and sleep around to, you know, get the money to feed their children or to go do other risky behaviors because they're trying to take care of home. Mm-hmm. Now, you're a wonderful activist, and, and I love your mission, because here's the problem, and this is what I want you to do for me right now. When we talk about HIV, we hear two extremes. We hear the negative extreme to where, you know, like you just said, you don't want anyone to be afraid. But then we have the other extreme where we have Magic Johnson and his cocktails and he's staying alive. There is, there pretty much, so we have to break stereotypes, we have to break stigmas, we have to break a lot of things. What are you doing to break those extremes and those stigmas? Right now, the only, um, I'm you know, speaking, around my voice to be heard. I mean, telling people, you know, no one even can say, Magic Johnson is taking this pill, you know, the wonderful pill. There is a nice pill that you can take, you know, but when you're HIV positive, everyone is different. Everyone takes it on different, um, okay, um, when people come up to me, they ask me, you know, what you know, I don't know much about HIV or, you know, I just met you and you're telling me, but where do I go? The best place that you can go or you can start is your family doctor if you have one. Um, you can go to your, um, if you're, organizations in the community that you can um, help. The health services, health clinics that you can go to to get um, to get information about HIV and AIDS. They have hotlines in your community that you can call. Um, so the best place to start is your family doctor or a health clinic um, is the best place to go for um, HIV and AIDS information. Okay, okay. Now, I do know you. And what can you do for me as far as education? As far as education, you do know me. Continue to, you know, hear me, hear what I'm saying. Um, and, 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 you know, when people come to me, I'm like, come to my organization or, or come to an event that I'm having to be more educated about HIV and AIDS. I know a lot of my friends that do know me in the community, a lot of them will tell me, you know, Monique, there was one time where I wouldn't even touch someone that had HIV and AIDS because they didn't, they weren't educated. And they'll come back to me and they'll say, because I know who you are now and I look at your life living, you know, I come to your events, um, I just come and have a lunch with you, Monique. I'm now, you know, you know, I'm educated. You know, and I realized that, you know, people with HIV and AIDS is not going to harm you. Right. So, so a lot of them will come back to me and they'll say things like that. Okay. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more question and I'm going to switch gears and wrap it up for you. Um, you just told me in the beginning of this interview that you're married 
you yeah, that that you that you that you are that you are married and um so that means that means and let me see if I can answer this correctly because I know because I know a lot of people that this I mean you can have a normal love life with HIV. Yes. It is very possible. So you have remarried. Yes. And um, how's that marriage going? Everything going okay? Everything is going lovely. Um, In other words, I, I'm, di I'm dishing for a story here. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh -huh. I'm, dish I'm dishing for a how we met story. <laughs> <laughs> My audience wants a love story. Uh, Go ahead. On a uh, book number book number two, uh, how we um, actually just met. Um, it was on book number two. Um, how we actually just met. I mean, I'm how I met uh, my husband. But uh, once I came public, and um, once I came public, once I started getting myself together, like I said, once I started loving, you know, myself as a person, once I started accepting the fact that hey, Monique, you got HIV. You got your three boys. You still gotta live. You know, I wasn't looking. I wasn't looking for love. I, you know, I was already going through. You know what happened in my, you know, my previous marriage. I just wanted to live life and be happy. But I guess what that saying, what God has for you, it is for you. You can't stop God's blessings. Um, my husband, who I am married to now, you know, we met after I came public, and he he loved me from for me. Um, I was the second person he ever knew that had HIV. He knew someone back in school. Um, but other than that, he, he, he told me he wasn't, you know, educated about HIV and AIDS, none of that. Um, but when he met me, he just said that he had loved me as a person. He said the things that, how I treated my boys, how I lived my life, he loved that. He loved that about a, about a woman. You know, he loved that I took care of them and how I, how I just carried myself as a person. Um, so, you know, he went to my doctor appointments with me. He saw me for, you know, when I told him I was HIV positive, he looked, no, I mean, he just looked at me like, okay, you know, you're, you're still, you're, you still deserve to be loved. You know, you still deserve anything else that any other woman, you know, any other woman has, you deserve it to me. You know, I, I don't, I don't feel that I should treat you any different. And yes, I thought he was kidding. I thought he was lying. I was like, something's wrong with this man. Um, however, he began to show me he was there. He was supportive. And he asked my hand in marriage. And once again, I thought he was, I thought that was a joke. I was like, man, they lying. You know, you, there's no way. Out of all these ladies out here, there's no way you would want to marry me. And he proved, you know, he proved himself and we got married. Had 36 people in our wedding party, had a big wedding. Everyone was there, excited, and we've been married going on three years in June. You know, you're lucky you married this man because, see, this was been... I'm sorry, he is HIV negative. You know, when I, a lot of people will ask that question, they're always curious. My husband is HIV negative, and yes, he hugs me, kiss me, do whatever. I mean, because he has been educated about the do's and don'ts um, when he is with me. Well, I should be honest with you. I actually have a friend who's HIV positive who's married to a an HIV negative man. They've been married for almost fifteen years. So, like I say, it's not it's really, possible. yeah, it's not, yeah, it's really no surprise to me. But I was actually going to tell you, you may be lucky you married this man, or you would have been. This would have been a whole different interview with me clowning you <laughs> for pushing away your I'm blessing. A lot. At, yeah, I go speak. I hear a lot. When I go speak and stuff, a lot of people will be like. You know, Monique, and it, 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 it actually amazes me when I actually go speak and I start talking about me. And sometimes I don't even get to the marriage part yet when I do speak from places. And there's people who be like, you know what, Monique, if, you know, if you were in our state or, you know, I would date you or I would love to be. And it amazes me because I, I'm telling them my story. I, like I said, it's just lack of education. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, I feel like people need education because HIV and AIDS is not a death sentence. You know, it's not a death sentence. You know, there's nothing. It's all about education. And that's what it's all about. I mean, it's definitely what it's all about. So everyone's happy. You're good. So now what is going on besides the ministry, besides the um, foundation? What else is going on in Monique's life? Right now, I'm just I'm enjoying life. Um, I'm actually, uh, my kids keep me busy. The boys are all in sports, <laughs> so they got me all over the place. I have one myself. Um, I still speak. <laughs> 
Um, so I have some speaking engagements coming up here soon. Um, I'm about to plan a my second um, Monique's uh, aid, uh, Hope for Cure aid walk. We're, we're actually planning that for the later part of the year. We're actually, actually about to plan a uh, gala for me. Um, so I'm just enjoying life right now. Um, like I said, with the boys. Okay. And uh, are you having any other books planned? That's in the beacon. I'm writing as I, as I speak. I'm, I'm starting to, to write some more, so. Okay. And uh, my final question, do you have any words of wisdom or anything that you want to say? I always give my interviewees the final word. You know, if I, were, if I had to leave some, a word to anyone that's listening is, you know, whatever you're going through, no matter what it is, you know, you can make it, you know. You can make it and get through whatever situation. Hold your head up and keep going. Keep going. Keep push through it, you know. That's what I would tell any and everybody. It begins just to love yourself and love everyone because you never know when the next person is facing. So we should all be there for each other and have that, you know, that re- that ear to listen and that shoulder to cry on if needed. Just just be there for one another. I mean, society, you know, we tend to stray away and, and talk about the next person or pull the next person down. But in a sense, we all, we all can learn from one another. Journey. 
Try How to Lose a Black Woman and Geraldine at your local bookstore, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or on your Nook and Candle tablet. Welcome back. My next author is James Jackson. He's an author and an entrepreneur. Get to know about him and his business right now. Alright, well, when I first actually amateur kind of writing, it was, uh, I was in 11th grade. Um, I guess you say my deceased uncle started it. Uh, I'm not really sure. What happened was my uncle died two weeks before my 11th grade year was to start. And I was comforting my mom who was grieving, so I really did not get a chance to grieve. And through the first semester, um, I don't know, I guess the story just kept popping in my head. And I would never write it down, so it got to a point where I was starting to get a headache until I literally started writing the words on paper. And then it just flowed, you see. And as time went on, I, I wrote like three other stories. However, I didn't really type them up because I just don't feel necessary that I have to. Um, I'm not motivated as still can do it. So I changed when I got out of college and went into poetry. Um, now what really started my first poem was If I Told You, which is the title of the book. It was basically me writing that particular title and then the idea of HIV AIDS because I was talking to someone about wanting me to speak at a AIDS HIV conference. And so I didn't have a title or anything to talk about. And so once I wrote that title, if I told you, the words just sort of flowed in that poem, which is basically a question format about a person who is constantly, who's asking a spouse or a friend or someone you know, important in their lives, what would you do if I told you I had this disease and how would you treat me? And you know, would you use me or would you stay with me and help me through it and things like that. Okay. Okay. So pretty much so. So let's go straight on into basically how did that transition into your first book? Okay. So when I started writing, I posted my work on Brenda Jackson, who is also an author. Really I good. posted it on her, her um, Yahoo group. Because I have been a part of that for quite some time. And a lot of people on there were like, James, you know, you should get published and nobody will steal your work and you should, you know, uh, print out the copies and send it to yourself in the mail and things like that. And so what happened was, what really pushed me to actually publish my first book was the summer of 2013 when um, I had used up all my student financial aid for school and I needed that source of income and I really wasn't working because in my major as a business student, you really don't have that time to work because you have to do a lot of after school activities or a lot of after school projects which consume up time being that we are a business student and things like that. So I decided to push the book and just try self publishing. Now another thing that inspired me to do that as well was I saw someone get killed um, behind the apartment complex where I stayed. Mm. And I was the first person to call 911 and to actually, you know, I don't want to go into too many details, but that was also something that made me push to have it book done, that way I could get out of here and, you know, try to have some type of standing to the point where I won't have to go down the road that that person went down, which from what they said was maybe drug related, I'm not really sure it happened last summer okay okay well from all of this from all of this and you've got the book and you've seen so much you know i'm not going to say tragic but you've seen so much bad going on how do you stay positive well in my life i've seen a um, a lot of tragedy and badness you know i was accused of molesting my sisters by my birth mother just so she can try to hurt me, um, or at least hurt my adoptive mom. And so through all that, I had to find a way to cope. 
You know, what a lot of people don't know is I've been accused of being gay. You know, so I've had several people call me gay within my family on the street. That's because I chose to keep my hands in the book. And of course, you wouldn't be the first person to ask me, well, how could you be so positive under all this? And I guess I can say, you know, God being one, my mom being two, but also being a fan of Michael Jackson, you see, and watching the things that he went through and how he was able to keep his positive nature or good nature. And that's what made me want to strive to do the same thing. And so no matter how bad my life gets, I always try to look on the bright side. It's not always easy though. I think people should know that it really is. And I have a friend right now who's struggling and she's fighting with me because I'm trying to get her to be positive. That way she won't do anything crazy. And she, you know, so it's not always easy. Okay. I mean, cause like I say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears here for a second. I'm just gonna say, um, I met James uh, through one of my sites, um, and you and pretty much so you you were asking me questions. But see, you're a powerful author in your own right, which you know, which I don't, which really I don't mind being of help. But you're pretty much so, like I say. You see it, you write it, you brought it, you bring it on your own accord. Um, so I said all that to say is, as far as I'm concerned, you're very successful to me. And there's nowhere to, there's nowhere to go but up for you. So so God is bringing you out of a lot of things. Well, I thank you for that. Oh, I mean, no thanks needed. This is all, I just saw your talent, but I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Also, um, about that, I also posted on a website called Wattpad, uh, Wattpad which is W-A-T-T-P-A-D. And um, a lot, it's like a, uh, I, gotta, uh, I guess you know, it's a writing forum in a way. Like you, if you write music, poetry, stories, you can post it on this forum and share. But it's not like a uh, it's not like a blog or anything, you know, where you have your one page. You can literally go and see other people's work and comment on their work and share their work and like their work and and it's just a great tool to learn and have other people critique your things. And so I had a lot of people also on there who like my work, which is why some of the poems in my book got chosen was because of the feedback and the uh, popularity that they received on this site. Plus, I also entered twice into a poetry competition. I did not win the competition, but two of my poems were published in the competition book. And so I do have two of my poems in print in other people's book. Okay, okay. So like I say, you keep bringing out positive stuff, you're just gonna do well. I mean, pretty much so no matter what you do. Uh, do you have any more books you, in the works? If I can find somebody to help me turn my, well, get my um, written novel books on uh, paper, then I can uh, and help me transfer, transfer those into a story that's worthy of being put out there, then yeah, because like I said, I wrote at least three others books, not poetry, the three other novels, that I'm just trying to find somebody to help me shape it into a worthy book, you know, because right now I'm a little nervous about that one. Well, you know, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be an issue at all. I'm, I'm sure I can probably help, and there are probably some people out there that can help too. Um, so... Let's just say, I got yelled at from a few authors, you know, there's authors, just by asking. Now, there were two. Um, Sheila, I think it was Goss, and Miranda Parker, who started a, uh, I guess you'd call it a writer's group. It was a writer's group. And so they did help me get some of my writings down and everything. But I, I thank them both for that as well. But and see, that's pretty. Look, <laughs> can't talk to that. 
That's pretty cool. See, that's pretty cool. So that's the thing. All you have to do is ask. A lot of times we talk about networking. Um, networking is all about opening your mouth. Because no one knows you need help unless you ask. So basically, that's actually good advice you just gave. So and I, was, and I was happy that they um, actually started that group. They approached me with joining. And I was like, yes, because I've read their work and I respect the both of them. And like I said, a lot of people that I did meet, I met through groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, me being, my mom says I'm a people person. Everybody tells me I'm a people person, but I'm also a good judge of character. So that's why I guess. It helps my positive nature in a way when I can meet other people who are also positive. What? But what? I also like to tell people that I'm also a scorpion. Mm -hmm. Which would explain what happens when people make me mad. <laughs> because before, you know, I, I, I didn't read uh, horoscopes, but when I started reading them, I just found that a lot of things I did match the horoscope. Somewhat, so I always use that when people ask me why and why am I just a retard. So, mm -hmm. it, it, tell, it tell you I'm a scorpion. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I truly, and I mean that I truly understand. So, like I say, that's always help out there. So that's really, you know, thank God there's really never a lack of help, and that's always been part of my, um, been a part of my mission. We're all authors together, so we all should network together. Yeah. So, so switching gears for a second. Speaking of success, um, you also have a um, you also have a business. Can you please uh, outline that business for us? All right. So, the first business is a um, health fitness platform known as Vitalis. At first, I would like to share my story about that. Um, I was working with my former mentor who helped me come up with my flyer for my story, if I may. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. All right, um, so I'm gonna read it word for word because I think I got it perfect, I don't wanna mess up. Uh, my story is simple. I weighed 256 pounds and was looking for a safe and effective way to drop that weight and get healthy. On Facebook, on Facebook, talking about my struggle, I was approached by, by, by a Vitalis promoter known as Dr. Moni Cole, who instructed me to watch a video about the Vitalis 90-day challenge. I was in luck. I needed to lose the pounds, and Vitalis sounded like the right platform to help me achieve this goal. After watching the challenge video, I reconnected with Dr. Holmes and asked how I could sign up. As they say, the rest is history. I started on the transformation kit for my first 90 days, uh, for my first 90 day challenge, and then went in on the promoter balance kit. The photo, well, I can't say the photo as well, but um, my challenge kit was, my challenge was very successful. I ended up losing 60 pounds that I have managed to keep off since I stopped, say, seven months ago but I want to redo it, and I challenge anybody else to sign up who's willing to either lose 10 pounds or more, or gain 10 pounds of lean muscle or more. Okay. So, so pretty much, so you're selling, um, so you're selling health, health and fitness um, products? Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's centered around, when you, when you check out the pictures, and you show the pictures, it's centered around a meal replacement shake, five crunch cereal, which is similar to the shake, but instead of drinking it, you're eating it. Right. And also we have other products. Um, there's a lot of new things coming out now that I have to catch back up on, because like I said, I did <laughs> finish up my last semester. <laughs> right, right. So um, I, do have, I do have to catch up with some of the new products. But basically the shake is the core of it and the cereal, and because of those two things, we've changed up the packages and how they look and, you know, what gets added with what. So all of that will be on my website, along with the video um, that can be watched as well. Okay. So, um, so we can order by going to your website. Is there a number we can call for you or 
Anything we can, you know, any any other way to contact you, or just go to your website. My website, but also, I mean, if people want to contact me directly, is my phone number is eight one three three four five seven two nine four. But there's also a form you can fill out on the website that'll get you in contact with me. Okay. And one thing we do is we do challenge parties. Now, challenge parties are basically a like a taste tester of the product while you're watching the video. Mm -hmm. So we go to someone's house, they invite over people who want to lose weight or gain muscle or who just want to live a healthy lifestyle. They watch the video, we make the shakes, which you can add food to many different recipes to use with these shakes. And then we sign people up in and there. Now the good thing about this product is, if you become a promoter, there's a chance to enter the BMW club, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about that too much until people actually get there. Mm -hmm. You know, because we want people to be motivated for the healthier lifestyle change rather than the, you know, the assets of it. And so, when you sign up three people, you automatically get your kit for free, which means you're only paying for shipping and handling as a promoter. As you get those people to sign up, other people and so forth and so on, you make commissions off what who they sign up, but then those people, if they're promoters, also makes commissions. That is that side. Then there's just the customer side where if I was signing up three people and they just want to be customers, then that's all they would be. It's customers. I would still have to go out and get more people, but I would still get my product for free because I got those three people on. I would just get paid by not only those three people, but others as well as I got them on, and then if they became promoters and so forth and so on. And so there are many different ranks that we have, and all that will be explained on the video and during um, these challenge parties that we offer or have. Okay. Okay, pretty cool, pretty cool. So is this your only business that you have, or do you, or, or was the, or... Pretty much so do you uh, I, it's, the other one is not necessarily the business that I have it is more so that I'm a sales associate for a non for profit organization. Mm -hmm. And right now we're in the midst of creating a health care discount card, which is basically ten dollars a year, but it's a card where we go around trying to get businesses that offer either health services or healthy food and get them to tell us about discounts that they want to put onto the card. And we sell those cards at $10. Those cards last a year. And then the people who buy those cards can go to those businesses and use those discounts. So it's sort of like um, when you go to uh, one of these grocery stores and they do a rewards program, and when you swipe the card, you get like some change taken off a certain item. Okay. Well, that's what this is. Okay. And I, I'm just I'm just a sales promoter of that. You see. I got you. I got you. And then I'm also getting into supported employment, which is helping people find jobs. So I gotta take the test for that, so I can get certified for that as well. But that's something else I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're very very busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you, like I usually ask a lot of my uh, other, um, the other people I interview, you wear a lot of hats. Uh, and you say you're going to school as well? Well, right now I stopped. I, I graduated from the School of Business and Industry at Florida a and University as a business student, mm -hmm. undergrad. So right now I'm just trying to, uh, you know, at least make some money or stabilize myself first before I go for my master's. Okay. So, uh, so now, so right now, you're just basically just writing and doing the business. But I'm still trying to yeah. figure out how do you keep it all together? <laughs> well, well, for five salaries, they have what's called an upline. And uh, that's where if you're trying to do things like challenge parties or you're trying to get somebody to come on, call the people above you who know more about the business or who have a higher rank than you to talk to those individuals and get them more. So basically, I can like give my upline, you know, like Dr. Holmes or somebody 
their, their contact information, let them know that they will be reached by that particular person, and then I can sit back and focus on something else. Okay, okay. Well, and then no. after they make that contact, then that person will get back in contact with me and tell me and explain to me what they explain to the other person and so forth and so on, and then we just go from there. So my next so my next question is and I usually give everyone the final word on this. Do you have any out you know, do you have any words of wisdom, anything you want to say, anything you want to uh talk about as far as um wisdom or anyone who's trying to get to where you are? For me I always tell people never to give up. Uh, like I said before, when you ask me how can I how am I so positive? I always tell people, you know, life happens, but it's what we make of that life that determines who we are. And me personally, a lot of people in my family have been in and out of jail, and that was something that as a young child, I made the decision that I never wanted to go or even be near one. And so, like I said, when I said I referenced Michael Jackson, you know, because I'm a big fan of his, but he also played a big part in that. And his thing was to help other people even when you can help yourself. And so my positivity draws from him. You know, he went through a lot of stuff in his life, and so did I. I was accused of a lot of stuff, which shut me out completely. You know, it made me a loner. And even to this day, I still am a loner because it's so hard to trust a lot of people because you don't know who's going to hurt you, but at the same time, I'm also my own self-motivator. You know, I say, I was talking to my friend who's going through some of the same problems, but it's hard for me to try to convince her to be positive about it without wearing myself out. You know, because it's like I'm giving everything I can to try to tell her. So I always found that for me, it's better to be self-motivating and if somebody backs me on that self motivation, it just amplifies my own self motivation as opposed to trying to tell somebody who's not willing to self motivate. When we return, we'll talk to our author, editor, professional, Chanel Bacon, with this week's writing tip. Just who is author H.D. Campbell, you ask? He's the multi genre author you have yet to get to know. Once you open his books, you can have a romance, get wrapped up on a world of mystery and success, or you can go on a journey to stop an international incident. To learn more, log on to hdcampbell.weebly.com for book specials and more. And as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Stay away from me, you freak! Ah! Are we getting any closer, Mark? Before his book, Murder by Execution is released. Get to know investigative report of Mark Alexander in his first two books by author H.D. Campbell. Late murder at 10. Find the murder of news anchor killed on the air. Start, the virtual killer. Track down a very dangerous cyber serial killer before the body count rises. Get both books at your favorite bookstore at Amazon.com and other online outlets. Also available on Kindle and Nook. Fresh kit, manuscript editing, marketing, and more. What do you need? H.D. Campbell Productions will help you design a package you need for your project. Let us serve you with your literary or marketing needs. We do editing, press kits, book trailers, book formatting, marketing, web editing, and more. What can H.D. Campbell do for you? Log on to his website at hdcampbell.weebly.com for more information. You can email him at hdcampbell1230 at gmail.com or call him at 314-265-9169 so he can set up a package for you. Check us out, and as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Welcome back to the Office Corner. Now we're going to have a serious conversation about dialogue 
with Chanel Bacon. Hey there everyone, this is author, editor, and educator Chanel Bacon. Today I'd like to offer a short tip about dialogue. Often when I'm editing clients' work, I tend to see issues with dialogue because what the writer is trying to do is inform the reader of some piece of information that's important to the story. The problem is that they use the dialogue to do this, when instead you should be using the exposition of your story. Here's an example. You have two characters talking, and one character is really just an interviewer. They're asking questions to the other character so that that other character can talk about backstory, can talk about entire situations, can reveal every minute detail of a situation to the reader. And when we read that dialogue, the dialogue feels flat. It doesn't feel true because it's not a true conversation. It's just information you're trying to relay to the reader. Um, like I said, that type of information is good in the story. And if in revision you realize that this information is important and that your reader needs to know it, then of course find another place in the story to put it. Just don't put it in your dialogue. When you revise your dialogue, you want to look to make sure your dialogue is revealing character, that it is intensifying the conflict, that it is moving your current story and your current scene forward, that it has a real purpose to your story. Um, dialogue, what does the character say or not say? Um, how does the character say it? What does it reveal about the character, the personality? The, the internal conflict of your character. Really good dialogue, make sure to do those things. Um, I hope that this quick tip helped. Um, you can learn more about me at my official author website, chanelbacon.com. You can learn about my editorial services at CLG Entertainment, the clg-entertainment.com. I'd like to thank HD for having me, as always, and I'll be back soon with another tip. Thanks for having me. Hey, hey, uh, it's Tasha here, and I am going to be bringing you the hot news. When we return, we'll talk to Arthur, Tasha Bynum, with this week's gossip news, and then a final thought from HD Campbell. Hey, wait for me, you freak! Are we getting any closer, Mark? Before his book, Murder by Execution is released. Get to know investigative reporter Mark Alexander in his first two books by author H.D. Campbell. Late Murder at 10. Find the murder of news anchor killed on the air. Start. The Virtual Killer. Track down a very dangerous cyber serial killer before the body count rises. Get both books at your favorite bookstore at Amazon.com and other online outlets. Also available on Kindle and Nook. If I knew they were sending men this spy, we have to find the warhead! Stop an international incident right from your couch or bedroom. By the Sergeant Wise Guy Chronicles series by author H.D. Campbell. Read as American Agent Codename, Sergeant Wise Guy must use his powerful skills a battlefield strategy to find a Soviet nuclear warhead stolen during a time of unrest. Then read as he fights to stop a plague unleashed upon the East Coast. With each page turning, spine tingling page, you also get the chronicles of a wise, but wise cracking thorough agent. Get his view of life and the mission in the Sergeant Wise Guy series. Get both books at your favorite bookstore and at Amazon.com and other online outlets. Also available on Kindle and Nook. Just who is author H.D. Campbell, you ask? He's the multi-genre author you have yet to get to know. Once you open his book, you can have a romance, get wrapped up on a world of mystery and success, or you can go on a journey to stop an international incident. Log on to his new personal page at hdcampbell.weebly.com and look for it in the More section. Check out his latest blog, blog tours, book signings, release dates, and more. Then get updates from his author, H.D. Campbell Facebook page for the most latest. 
get to know H.C. Campbell and let your writing to your spirit. Now, on to our celebrity gossip segment with author Tasha Byer. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome into another edition of Author's Corner. I am your commentator today, uh, Tasha Tasha. And I have a lot of celebrity gossip for you guys. We have um, so much to get into, so let's just get started, okay? Today we're going to be talking about, uh, to begin with, I think we'll talk about Chris Brown getting out of jail. Um, that was a big thing that happened. It took them forever to release him. I don't know if you guys have been following this story, but he's been locked up forever, and I really don't know. It's been speculated that he rubbed elbows with someone all the way to he assaulted someone, so nobody knows what happened. Um, but I am happy as a fan for Chris to be coming home, well, to be home. So shout out to you, Chris Brown, and we look forward to more music and less drama, okay? Moving right along to Riri, of course. No uh, Chris Brown story is complete without Rihanna these days. So um, <laughs> I think ever since, what, 2008? Um, so anyway, um, Rihanna last night, um, she went to some sort of fashion awards show or something like that. I'm not really sure of what it was. I just saw the dress and I, okay. The dress is getting mixed reviews. People praise the dress, people hate the dress. However you feel about the dress, you have to see it, okay? Basically, Rihanna's naked. So for the guys out there, if you're watching, <laughs> it's worth it just to go see that. Um, uh, for the ladies out there, um, I don't know. Don't hate, go look at it. Tell me what you think. Um, and the only reason I say don't hate is because it's funny. If you say anything about how Rihanna looks or how, how disgraceful this outfit was, you're pegged as a hater. It's okay, I've been called a hater too. Um, but I, I do not like the dress, I do not like the look, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's, it's like her putting on saran wrap and then getting the fashionista award of the, of the year or something. I'm like, um, for someone to actually win a uh, fashion competition, don't they, shouldn't they have on clothes? <laughs> he has on nothing. But you guys decide, go over there and let me know what you think, okay? Um, also, what do we have? Uh, next up, uh, Justin Bieber was recorded when he was 15 years old in a video where he was saying the N-word, he was saying some offensive jokes towards black, all kind of stuff. Okay, I'm going to just say it like this. I'm not going to take a lot of time with this story. You guys have to look the story up so you can see it for yourself. Um, this was done when he was 15. I don't know Justin. I don't know if Justin is great. Places. That's not really what's in question for me. My thing is Justin has been rich and wealthy for a long time. Whoever's been holding on to this tape, shame on you, because you knew if he was saying all this stuff that he wasn't, um, you know, you knew who he was. So, uh, yeah, basically, I put it like this. You suck for holding on to this tape and then releasing it because, what, he didn't pay you this much? Not cool. So you are fired <laughs> for that. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, I don't know, you guys, um, I'm not a big Justin Bieber fan, could care less really one way or the other. Um, just ready to move on, really tired of the racism crap going on. So, we'll get done with that and then we're going to bring in, of course, Donald Sterling. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Donald Sterling goes to some unknown church <laughs> in the middle of struggle, I'm sure. <laughs> To be welcomed back to the black community and be welcomed with, uh, with uh, embraced with open arms by a black church. Let me tell you something. Just because you found a struggling church that needed to keep their lights on for another month does not mean that all black people and all black churches will be accepting you back into the community of which I don't know why you would be accepted for the community. You said some really hurtful, terrible things to your um, mistress who does not know she's black. I don't know how she doesn't know that. <laughs> because obviously I watched a, um interview with her on 2020 uh, a couple weeks ago and um, yeah, she was saying um, that uh, he says these things but he doesn't mean it and it's hard and he's really a good person and I'm sorry, when I get mad I don't go into racial tirades. Usually I, I, I voice my anger at who I'm angry with and I don't say things that don't have any meaning. I don't just grab issues out the sky to, to yell at, but hey, I guess Donald Sterling does in her opinion. So to her, whatever, we're moving on from her. Um, but yeah, so you guys, for all you uh, people out there, Donald Sterling is welcome back <laughs> in that black church, okay? 
Um, moving on to our next topic. Um, what else is going on? Oh my gosh, you guys have to watch R&B. Uh, we was at Atlanta. That's the show that I'm going to tell you guys to follow. If you would like me to do full reviews on that show, I could do that. Just go ahead and request a view because I love the show. It's super duper messy, but super duper awesome. Uh, Latavia Spencer, I believe Spencer's her last name, it may not be, but Latavia from um, uh, Destiny's Child, way back in the day, one of the original members, is back on uh, R&B Divas Atlanta, and um, the baby girl is not singing, and we don't know why she's not singing. She even fakes out Atlanta Jitis. She's not singing. She's on R&B Divas and not singing. I'm going to need you to sing. Whatever issues you have, we don't have enough time to counsel you, so just sing, let us hear your voice. If you suck, we're going to tell you. If you're great, we're going to tell you, okay? <laughs> just just pick a struggle. You do not, that like that's like me going on The Voice and being like, no, I don't think I should be using my pipes <laughs> tonight. <laughs> no, you picked a singing show to go on. So if you want to launch your acting career, go do that on Basketball Wives or something like that. We ain't got time for you, all right? Um, <laughs> so that's what I'll say to her, um, to Monifa and Therese. I want to say woohoo! I am so excited about those two. They're, uh, I just love them as a couple, so I'm happy and excited that they're planning their wedding. Um, let's see, who's next after that? Angie Stone, go sit down and let your daughter be who your daughter is and let her sing and do her thing. Uh, Angie Stone's daughter is like, a, like an ATL, kind of greedy, kind of hardcore, ride and smoke kind of girl. And she made a song called Riding and Smoking, I believe. And Angie Stone is mortified and doesn't want her to sing it. Let your daughter, if your daughter be riding and smoking, sorry, that's what she's been doing. Let her, let her go on and tell the world and share her story so we can hear about it and hear about all your business. <laughs> like, like when your daughter said that you weren't there for her, you were always on tour and you ignored her. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And Angie Stone said, don't say that. No, that's her experience. She's going to say it. So that's the price of fame. <laughs> Deal with it, Angie. And also stop being messy and stop trying to cause drama that isn't there between Faith and the other girls. Um, even though I thought it was real shady that Faith said they could buy tickets to the Grammys, that wasn't right. <laughs> that wasn't right. They are on an album that was done last year for the R&B Divas. Um, they're singing, I don't know, I haven't heard the album, but they're singing on it and um, I guess they're not nominated the, the song is nominated for a Grammy, but Faith Evans alone is mentioned, even though they all sung on it. Because according to the Grammys, 51% of the, of the album, whoever's on 51% owns the album. So that would be Faith Evans. And funny how she's on like the, the board for the Grammys or something. You would think she knew that, huh? Hmm, who knows? Anyway, so lots of beef, lots of drama, lots of crap going on on the Atlanta uh, Housewives. And just a little tidbit um, on some Atlanta Housewives of LA drama. Um, not Atlanta Housewives. House, wait, they're not even the Housewives, okay? <sighs> R.G. Divas LA drama, okay? Uh, Kelly Price from that from that show. Uh, remember, she got to an epic beef with Shantae Moore. I'm not going to go into all that. You guys got to look it up. It's good. It's juicy. And Kelly Price is scandalous. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> But anyway, she made a new video, and the show is basically uh, her saying something like, I don't have time for that, or I don't know what she's talking about. But anyway, it's something about drama and all this stuff, and it's, it, it's called It's My Time. And it's, a, you know, one of those songs that you sing, you're like, yeah, it's my time, and you get into it. Until she starts saying, uh, she's a diva, don't believe her, spread rumors, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, she has Kenny Lattimore in the video. Who is Sean T. Morris X? Messy, messy, messy. I'm more mad at Kenny Lattimore than I am at her. But because um, let me just tell you, if I'm if I'm gonna shade somebody and I'm gonna go get their ex, their ex is supposed to say no. I'm not gonna be shady to her. We have children together. Grow up, Kenny. Not cool. All right. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed this segment of uh, the author corner, of course, and then me commentating with your gossip. Let me know if you guys have any questions, any more news you want to share with me, feel free. I am Sasha Tasha, um, 77 at youngfahaku.com, I mean at YouTube, <laughs> at YouTube.com. So check me out there. Definitely keep watching the Author Corner, and I will see you guys next time. Bye! <laughs>
Thank you for tuning in to the Office Corner. Stay tuned next week for when I have two new powerful authors. And stay tuned for an all-new music special I'm doing with two very exclusive interviews from Show Me Records. Thank you. Have a good day. Peace. God bless. And as always, let your writing fuel your spirit.